Hi guys, welcome back to In Case Your Econ Struggles and welcome to a, another micro struggle. Today we're talking about adverse selection more in depth. Specifically, we're gonna do the full mathematical problem for an adverse selection problem. In a previous game theory video, I talked about the game tree for an adverse selection problem and signaling. I've also talked a little bit about the individual rationality and incentive compatibility constraints for an adverse selection problem. But now we're gonna go all the way through a full blown problem with the math. So like I said, in this video, we're just basically gonna go through an example problem and all the steps to solve such an example problem. So first, we'll take that long block of text that describes the problem, we'll turn that into sort of like a cheat sheet with less words and more math. Then we'll start setting up the problem and we'll think about the conceptual solution to that problem. And then we're just gonna go through the math. I'm gonna walk through all the math and talk about the answer. And then that'll be it. So timestamps are below if you would like to jump around, but let's get right into it. So here is the problem that we're facing today. You can see I've done a little bit of highlighting ahead of time just to make it a little cleaner. We've got a monopolist cloud storage firm, and we're gonna say that this firm can choose to provide any amount of storage, and we're gonna call that amount of storage S. That storage has to be greater than or equal to zero, just can't be negative to the consumer. The consumer gets some utility from this storage. Specifically, they're gonna get two alpha squared of this amount of storage minus P, which is price. Again, price has to be greater than or equal to zero. This alpha parameter can take on exactly two values. It can take on a low value or a high value, and I can tell because alpha low is less than alpha high. So I'm already thinking, well, this alpha parameter is something like how much I actually like storage. And if I'm a high type, I just like storage more than if I'm a low type. We're also gonna say the firm can come up with some sort of menu, and that menu are different pairs of storage amounts and prices. They can offer those packages to the consumer. The consumer can choose not to buy any of them, but if the consumer does want to buy a package, they can only buy one such package. They can't sort of like buy two or three and then combine them, they have to choose one. We're also going to assume that the firm has a profit function, It's just gonna be the revenue minus cost. Their cost is C times S, where C is just some marginal cost of producing the storage. We are also gonna say that the outside option for both parties is zero. That is to say that if the consumer doesn't buy anything, the consumer's utility is zero, and the firm's profit is also equal to zero. So we will deal with these specific parts as we go through this video, but let's first set up a sort of a cheat sheet just based on this information that we've read. So here is the cheat sheet that I've come up with based on the wording in the problem. So I have a firm, they're choosing storage S, their marginal cost is C greater than zero, so their total cost is SC. They choose a price that they charge the consumer a price, and they choose a price greater than or equal to zero for that service, for that storage, and their profit is P minus CS. The consumer in this problem gets a utility. Here's a utility function. This alpha is what we just talked about, where alpha indicates that the consumer really likes storage, and that's maybe alpha H, or they kind of like storage, which is alpha L. The firm can offer a different menu of options, and the consumer can either pick one package or zero packages. And if there's no sale, the firm or consumer gets zero. So again, this is useful because this problem is gonna take a lot of pages to go through and solve. So as I'm going through this problem, rather than having to turn back to that first page and read the problem over and over again, I can put this on my first answer sheet sort of at the top. Maybe I'll put it on its own sheet. And so as I'm going through and sort of looking back at the problem, I can only look back at the cheat sheet and not at the actual problem. And that's just gonna help me keep track of things better. So in order to talk about the conceptual solution, well, the first part of this problem sort of guides us to that. So the first part of this problem asks us to plot the indifference curves of the consumer and the ISO profits, and it asks about the single crossing property, which is just a function of adverse selection problems that I'll talk about in a different video. So if I have this ISO profit, notice that profit is P minus SC, which we've talked about. I'm just gonna take a total derivative, which is one times DP minus C times DS. And so DP over DS is equal to C, which means that my ISO profits look like this in blue, where they're just lines. And I can do the same for the indifference curve, where I'm just going to take the total derivative of this guy, and I'm gonna get DP DS as alpha over the square root of S, which is concave utility and looks something like this. Notice that if I'm alpha high, my slope is greater. So the two indifference curves are gonna look sort of like this. And because they look like this, you can also tell mathematically because the derivative of their indifference curves with respect to alpha is positive. So we've satisfied the single crossing property. Now notice that these two sides are sort of opposed. They wanna go in opposite directions. These are the profit functions. When does the firm get higher profit? 
Well, the firm gets the highest profit when they sell something for a lot of money and have zero storage. On the other hand, the consumer is happiest if they get a lot of storage and no price. So these indifference curves and ISO profit curves are moving in opposite directions. And so you can see we're sort of going to get to a point at which the ISO profit is going to be tangent to the indifference curve. Both sides want to move in opposite directions. And so at our maximum, they'll just barely touch. Now we're going to go ahead and start getting into solving, but we're going to sort of dip our toes into the water. We're going to first ask, well, pretend there's no uncertainty. Let's say you walk into this store and there's a giant sign above your head. The giant sign above your head tells you whether you're a low type or a high type. Well, if I know whether or not you're a low type or a high type, I can know exactly what package to offer you to get the most amount of surplus out of that transaction, meaning there's a total surplus when we do this transaction and I, as the firm, am going to take all of it because I know your willingness to pay and I can sort of take all that surplus for myself. So the firm profit maximization problem, I'm maximizing my profit subject to the fact that I, as the consumer, want to participate. So I'm better off than just doing nothing or not buying, which is my individual rationality constraint. Similarly to the firm, I want my profit to be greater than or equal to zero because if not, then I don't want to participate in this market and that seems sort of weird. So what we're going to do, we're going to assume that the individual rationality of the consumer binds for the exact reason that we just talked about, where the firm is going to be able to extract all of the surplus from this transaction, which is going to make the consumer just barely indifferent between buying this package and not. Well, if they're just barely indifferent, then this is going to be an equal sign, which means that price is equal to 2 alpha squared of S. So then I can go ahead and put 2 alpha squared of S back into my profit maximization problem in my objective function. I'm going to take a first order condition. I'm going to put in some Kuhn Tucker conditions here, which are right here and I talked about in a previous video. Notice that in this case, it doesn't make sense to offer a storage star of zero. And the reason it doesn't make any sense is because if that were the case, there is no reason that this consumer would buy it. You would violate the individual rationality constraint of the consumer because you get a zero here. And the only thing that would make sense is for price to be zero here. And if price were zero and storage were zero, well, then you're not buying anything and there's really no participation. So assuming that that first order condition is equal to zero, we're going to have this S star equal to alpha star over C squared and price. We're just going to plug in two alpha squared of S and get two alpha squared over C. And we'll just verify that profit is greater than zero or that the individual rationality constraint of the firm holds and we can see it does. So we're done. So basically in full information, if everyone knows everything, if the firm knows what type of consumer you are, they're going to offer you a package such that the storage amount is alpha squared over C squared and the price is two alpha squared over C. Now in parts C and D and kind of part E, but really C and D. Now we're going to introduce this asymmetric information, this uncertainty about types, this adverse selection problem. We're going to say that the firm doesn't know whether or not you're a high type or a low type. There's no sign above their head. People are just walking in. And we do know based on some research that in the population, lambda percent of the people are low types and one minus the lambda percent of people are high types. So what we're going to do is we're just going to write down this maximization problem. That's sort of part C. In part D, we're going to ask, is there such a situation in which the firm offers two different packages of storage and price where one storage price package is geared towards high types and another different storage price package is geared towards low types. So we're going to ask that. And then in part E, what we're going to say is we know what happens when there's full information. And now to part D, we'll know what happens when there's not full information or asymmetric information. We'll compare what happens, what packages are offered to high types and low types, and we'll sort of look at who's better off and who's worse off. So let's get into this a little bit. And we're just set up the expected profit maximization problem for the firm. So an expected profit, well, there's a lambda chance that the person who walks in is a low type. Here's the profit for a low type. If I offer them a package for PL and a storage amount SL, there's a one minus lambda chance that they walk in and they're a high type, which is PH minus C times SH. And then since we're doing an adverse selection problem, we have a full blown four constraints in this problem. So here are the constraints one by one. So I've got the individual rationality constraints for the low type and the high type. All that means is that the utility you get from buying the package designed from you must be at least as good as the utility you get if you don't buy anything at all, which we know is zero. The incentive compatibility constraints for both the high type and the low type. All we're asking, if you have two packages, you should be better off. You should be happier buying the one that's designed for you, which means you're revealing your type. 
and you shouldn't have an incentive to sort of cheat and pretend that you're the other type. So if that's the case, that would mean that if you're a high type, this is the utility you get as a high type from a high type package. That's gonna be greater than or equal to the utility you get as a high type from buying the low type package. And similarly for low types, the utility you get from buying the low type package as a low type must be greater than or equal to the utility you get as a low type from buying the high package. So that's all these constraints mean. I understand that when I just wrote those, they're kind of small. So here they are just slightly bigger with a little more notes about basically what I've just said. The reason I want you guys to really understand this is because as we start solving this problem, we're gonna use these constraints to sort of make our problem a little easier. And so we're gonna to have to be really familiar working with these sort of constraints. Now, before we start getting into the math, let's pause, let's take a second and think about conceptually what makes sense to happen between a firm and consumer in this sort of situation. So let's pretend that we're the firms and you know that there are some high types and there are some low types, but the high types like the storage service more, so they're gonna have a higher willingness to pay for that service at the same storage level, which means that I as the firm want those high types to buy because I'm gonna be able to charge them a higher price, and if I'm able to charge them a higher price, that means I'm going to get a higher profit. So I definitely want the high types to buy, which means that my individual rationality constraint for the high type should definitely hold. It should be positively greater than zero, not greater than or equal to zero. For the low types, I'm sort of meh about them buying. They like storage, but they're not willing to pay nearly as much as the high types. So really, whether or not they buy is sort I'm sort of indifferent between those two things. And if I'm indifferent between those two things, that means that the individual rationality constraint for the low type should bind, should be equal to zero. The other thing to think about is that if I'm the firm and I design these two different packages, if the high types are just indifferent between buying the package designed for them and the package designed for low types, that's not great because that means that I could probably do things a little differently to get them to purely buy the package designed for them and squeeze even more surplus out of them and even more surplus out of the low types. So what that's gonna mean is the incentive compatibility for the high type should bind because the high type should just barely wanna reveal their type to me. Maybe I have to pay them a little bit in order to do that, but it should be pretty darn close. And the incentive compatibility for the low type should definitely hold. I, I don't want any low types to even be tempted to sort of go towards that high package because they're tempted to go to the high package. That would probably mean that high package is probably a little too good and I should change it so that it's less storage for more price. The reason again that we're going through this conceptually is because we've got a lot of math to get through. And if I can use this intuition to help me sort of think about which constraints bind and which constraints hold, it's gonna be a little easier down the road. Now, just looking at a problem, it may not be that clear which constraints are gonna bind and which constraints are just gonna hold. In that case, just think about it. Think about the constraints that you think would bind and hold, and then you're just gonna go through and have to test them. If you start working through the math, it's not working out, something's going wrong. You might have to go back and change your assumptions about which constraints bind and which constraints hold, but at least if you write down your thinking as you're going through the math, your professor can understand your train of thought and it's probably gonna be pretty beneficial to you. If you just start doing a lot of math with very little writing about why you're doing what you're doing, it's gonna be really hard to understand that you actually know what you're doing and not just doing a bunch of math that you memorized. So when in doubt, write out your line of thinking. It could be helpful for you, especially on a test or a homework question. With that out of the way, let's just keep going. Here are the four constraints that I rewrote with the binding and holding that we just assumed. So for example, I assume that IRL binds, so it's equal to zero, and the IRH should hold, so it's greater than zero. Same for ICH and ICL. So from equation one, I get that the price for low types is two alpha L squared of SL, and I can combine that with equation three to get this lovely equation here and solve that for pH. I'm gonna call that equation, which I sort of simplify a little bit, equation five. And then I'm gonna rewrite equation four just a little bit to be pH minus PL, because I have an expression for pH, I have an expression for PL, and that looks like it's gonna work kind of nicely. How do I know exactly what steps to take for these four constraints? Short answer, I don't. I'm just doing a bunch of algebra. My goal is to simplify this into one single constraint, because if I could simplify these into one simple constraint, it's gonna make taking the first order condition of that profit maximization problem a lot easier. And so if I can simplify these and get rid of as many constraints as possible, it's gonna help me in the long run. 
As you all know, when you're doing a bunch of equation simplification, sometimes it works well the first time, sometimes it doesn't. You just got to keep working, keep seeing what you can do, and keep trying to simplify this as much as possible before you start taking those first order conditions. So let's just move on. Now I'm going to combine equation 4, equation 5, and equation 1, and I'm going to get this lovely equation here. So just as a reminder, this is equation 4 where all I'm doing is plugging in for PL and for PH to get this left-hand side of the equation. I'm leaving the right-hand side of equation four just intact, and that's gonna tell me that two alpha H, this stuff is greater than or equal to this. And we know that alpha H is greater than alpha L, so what needs to happen is we just need SH to be greater than or equal to SL. So now we know that for a separating equilibrium, it must be the case that the amount of storage you offer a high type is greater than or equal to the amount of storage you offer a low type. Which you might think, well, that seems sort of obvious, but we need the math to do this, because if this didn't work out, then you would say, well, there's not a separating equilibrium that would work for high types and low types to have different packages. But if we have this condition such that we offer more storage to the high types than the low types, then it's possible and we're good and we're just gonna keep plugging away. Now that we've simplified our constraint into one single constraint, it's gonna be a lot easier to take this first order condition Notice I redid the profit maximization problem. I made some substitutions, right? This is PL, this is PH right here. And now I'm just gonna take a first order condition with SH and SL. I'm not gonna use the Kuhn-Tugger conditions because we saw earlier that we said that S star equal to zero doesn't make sense even in full information. So it's definitely not gonna make sense that SH or SL star equals zero in this case either. So I'm just gonna go right to equals to zero and I'm gonna get that SH star is this guy and SL star is this guy. If you're having trouble following the simplification, definitely drop a comment below and I'll add sort of a supplemental video, but try it on your own. I think this should be relatively straightforward. And again, just comment below if it's not. So now that we have SH star and SL star, we need to make sure that it is indeed the case that the amount of storage we offer the high types is higher than the amount of storage we offer the low types. So here's the amount of storage we offer the high types. Is this greater than the amount of storage we offer the low types? Once again, we do some simplification. And it's true if this lambda is less than or equal to 1, which it definitely is. And alpha L is less than alpha H, which it definitely is. So that means that we for sure have a separating equilibrium where the firm is going to offer a different unique package to the high types than they offer to the low types. So we can use these equations to find pH star and PL star. And we can also see that the profit of all of this, the expected profit, is also greater than zero. I haven't done this in this video. Again, drop a comment if you would like to see that. But try it on your own. It should be relatively straightforward. Now that we've sort of climbed our way over this gigantic mountain of a problem, I just wanted to put this information in a sort of a table. Where in pink, we have the results from full information. And in green, we have the results from this partial or this asymmetric information. So you can see that high types they used to pay 2 alpha squared h over c. Now they pay 2 alpha squared h over c minus this giant term here. Why do they pay a lower price? Well, because the firm needs to incentivize the high types to sort of put that sign over their head willingly that says that they're a high type. How do you get someone to willingly put a sign over their head that says they're a high type? You offer them a discount off the price. So that's exactly that discount. We call that informational rent, and that's right here. And you can see they're getting the same amount of storage as before, so they're actually better off under partial information than full information. They're basically getting the same package as before, but for a slightly lower price. Now, if you're a low type, it is not the case that you're better off. You're going to be exactly as well off as you were before. Now, why is that? Well, remember that before under full information, the firm was extracting all the surplus from that transaction. So you as the low type and the high type were getting a utility of zero from your package. Now they are still going to be getting a utility of zero from that package. And again, that makes sense because we said that the individual rationality constraint of the low type binds. So it's just as good as their outside option. Their outside option is zero. In full information, their outside option is also zero. So the expression is more complicated, but it's still the case that their utility is equal to the outside option. So they're no better off under partial information than under full information. So I know this was a lot. Definitely feel free to drop a comment if there was anything you didn't understand. But if this was helpful, make sure to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.